All right, welcome back to church on this Sunday evening. Come on in, find your place. Join me by way of standing, and let's use our song books tonight. Let's turn to song number 33. Song number 33, we're going to sing about our wonderful Savior. We'll sing both verses. Page number 33. What a wonderful Savior is He. Sing it with me on the first verse. Page 33 on the first. And I have started out to follow Jesus. Every day, every hour I want to be. Just a little more like my blessed Jesus. He means more than all the world to me. Oh, wonderful, wonderful is Jesus. He gave his life on cruel Calvary. He'll be there when I start to cross the Jordan. What a wonderful Savior is He. On the second page, 33, if you need it. In His footsteps I will always follow. In His ever-gracious presence I would be. Though the storms of life may rage, my Lord will guide me. What a kind and faithful Savior is He. Oh, wonderful, wonderful is Jesus. He gave His life on cruel Calvary. He'll be there when I start to cross the Jordan. What a wonderful Savior is He. Amen. Lord was working today, I tell you. Man, it's exciting. Whew. You see, the Lord bound Satan after a while. You see that? See that? He was trying to disrupt our service because if we had to evacuate today, amen, two people wouldn't have gotten saved, two people wouldn't have got baptized, and rededication of life. Amen? amen. I mean, God was working today, and I'm excited about it. And uh, I'm going to say this, church. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sticking with me and for not running and screaming and panicking. Amen. Thank you for doing well, church, because uh, obviously uh, if there's a fire, we're, we're going to get out of here. But we have a great security team that has protocols in place that keeps it all organized and safe. And we might go through that again soon uh, because it might be necessary again. But listen, thank you for just being under control. Amen. And uh, because of that, because we didn't lose control, because... Uh, Whatever fire there was, it got put out, amen, and the Lord saved souls today, amen. amen, and the Lord helped some people grow, and I love that, I love it. Now, tonight's exciting, because tonight is the deacon vote, amen, and I didn't even mention that today, I forgot, I was all excited about catching on fire, and uh, I never even mentioned it, and so tonight, after service, don't forget that church members, 18 and above, are going to vote on uh, the deacons that uh, we have been have been presented with, that uh, we've uh, listen. I believe in these men. I believe they're spiritual men, and uh, I'm I'm for them. And you asked the deacons, our current deacons. We prayed over God, who would you have for us? And we started to nominate some, or we started to talk about some different men. And then we all came together in agreement, and we nominated these two men. And I believe that uh, this would be what God wants. And we've been praying over this. And I hope church that you've been praying too. And we ask church you to, 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 um, to do as the Lord leads there, but it's a yay or nay tonight. Amen. And I'm going to ask you please to, uh, to vote tonight after that. If you have not, if you have not, church member, signed in for the evening service, I need you to do that, please. If you didn't go by a man with a, with a, a notepad or iPad or whatnot and sign you in when you came in, I need to know that you're here so that we can get the right numbers and all that. So please, if you would, go to the door uh, here right after I pray and uh, take care of that, please, if you didn't get checked in. And so let's let God work again tonight. Amen? Okay, I got some of you. Amen. Everybody okay? Brother Chris, you all right? Amen, all right, good. Amen. Brother Christian? Brother Christian, why don't you hop up here? Why don't you open us in prayer tonight? I look, happen to look down at you, and there you are smiling. So why don't you pray for us tonight? All right, thank you. Father, as we come to you this evening, I thank you so much for our church, and I thank you for a country that we still have the freedom that we can meet. 
Father, I pray that you would be with our service tonight. I pray that you would meet with us. And, Father, without your spirit, it, it would be in vain for us to be here tonight. Father, we need you. I, I pray for a touch of revival in our church. Father, we need it. And I know I desire it. And I pray for it, Lord. I pray that you would touch especially tonight. I pray that you be with Pastor. I pray you give him the wisdom and the knowledge that he needs to preach. I pray that you be with the deacon vote. I pray that all, everyone would vote as you would lead. And I pray for your will to be done there, Father. I pray for your hand upon our service. And I pray that you would meet with us and give us all something tonight that we can take home. In your name I pray. Amen. Maybe. Maybe.
Good job, ladies. Amen. That's our group rescued from the fire today. Amen. Amen and amen. I says, uh, well, I had to cancel you. Why don't you just sing tonight? Amen. Amen. Now, wait a minute. I'm looking over here. That looks like Michael Rains. Is that, is that you, brother? Amen. We've got Kenyan missionaries with us tonight. Praise the Lord. It's been years since we, I've seen you. Uh, praise the Lord. Thanks for being here tonight. Now, this is your family here. Two daughters with you. Well, thank you for being here tonight. And they're, gonna, they're scheduled to be with us in a couple months. Uh, remember, we've got our missions conference. We're trying to reach Africa. Praise the Lord. And we've got uh, uh, veteran Kenyan missionaries with us. You are still in Kenya, aren't you? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And, uh, and so they're going to be with us two weeks after our missions conference and just kind of continue it on there. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Thanks for being here tonight, stopping through. And uh, amen. All right. Anybody else here for the first time tonight? Anybody at all? First time tonight. I want to get you a, a, a connection card tonight. Anybody at all? Wave at me. Come on, somebody. No? Good. All right. We got a lot of family in with us tonight because... It's a vote on the deacons' night. Praise God. And um, again, I forgive me for not mentioning that this morning. I was all excited about fire and, and what I was preaching. And I got lit on fire. And praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, I just was excited. I was, I was a little bit passionate about what I was preaching today. And uh, I don't apologize for that. God gave it to me, and I was excited about it. And so uh, we need to fight off the wolves. Because there's too much junk coming into the church, and people are buying into stuff and going astray, and the devil's using that. And so thank you for being here today, and thanks for being back tonight. And praise the Lord for that. All right. Um, just again, quick note. Um, Brother, uh, Brother Timmerman, is that you up there? Do you have the picture of the men and the deacons? Do you have that up? Look at that. Amen. All right. So tonight is the deacon vote. Remember... Uh, we have uh, nominated, the deacon, a uh, group of deacons have nominated Brother Dale Gaylor and Brother Adam Garant, and um, I'm behind these men, and I'm excited about this, and I'm uh, asking church you to uh, vote, to cast your vote tonight, and that'll be right after the invitation tonight, and uh, praise the Lord for that, and so thank you very much for that. Let's take our song books again, number 26, please, number 26 in your song books. As we turn over there, you can remain seated. Then I met the master, number 26 tonight. Here's a good song, number 26. Do we know this? Some of us, amen. I thought you said you didn't know it. Oh, okay. 26. See, Brother Kidwell and I, we have this great relationship. Right before service, he says, uh, you want to lead any songs tonight? Because uh, I'm not sure I know them. And then uh, I'll say the same thing back to him. And so uh, I was leading these ones because I didn't think he knew them, but now he's saying amen. All right, so here we go. Number 26, please. Then I met the master. Sing with me if you would, please. Like a babe when it cries for its mother.
things have changed. Amen. Anybody a new creature in here? Amen. Come on. Amen. That's what the Bible says. We get saved. We're new creatures in Christ. Amen. All, all things, uh, uh, praise the Lord, are, are new in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's turn over, please, to 27. Well, turn over. It's right there. Amen. Right on the same page. Amen. Something about that name. I love this song. And great song. We'll probably sing it a couple times. And brother, we love you, Brother Stanley. But I'll probably, we'll I'll probably have to do this a cappella the second time through. Because uh, I want to hear you sing it. No, he don't want to sing it. Okay, all right. Here we go. Here we go. Ready, church. Ready. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that. Sing it again. Here we go. Ready? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's a something about that name. Instruments, drop out, would you please? Here we go. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance. After the rain, amen. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will But there's something about that name. And all God's people said, yeah. amen. Whew. Man, oh man, oh man. Praise the Lord. Phyllis Wolford has got her hand in the air. Watch out. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, songs, I'm telling you what, when there's truth in a song that you're singing and it's doctrinally accurate, God uses that thing big time. I'm telling you, if you, when you spend your time with the Lord and you're in your Bible and you are praying, I'm telling you what, if you have a songbook, use it. Use it. If you don't have one, get one. Uh, they're not that expensive. You can pick one up. Uh, even, even the one that we use, you could get it brand new for like 10, 12 bucks. And I'm telling you what, use it. There, it is good. I tell, God gives you, the Bible says, when you're filled with the Spirit, He gives you a song in your heart. And sometimes you can express through song that uh, just that emotion that God's got, got turn inside of you because you spent time with it. And uh, praise the Lord for it. And thank you for that. Amen. Thank you for that. Praise the Lord. Amen and amen. Brother Williams, would you come and talk to us about this weekend? I'm excited about it. Please. Well, amen. Well, last year we enjoyed a wonderful Bible assembly project that we put together, of course, Bibles for Belize. This year we get to put bilingual uh, John and Romans together uh, that have English and, I want to try to pronounce it, Chichua, I believe it is, uh, language uh, in uh, foregoing to Malawi. And uh, those uh, uh, scriptures will be coming with Brother Alan Johnson, Wings Bearing Precious Seed, 
Uh, he'll be arriving on Friday. Uh, we'll be getting things set up, and then, of course, Saturday morning, we will begin that Bible Assembly project. If you haven't already signed up, may I encourage you to do so. There is something about putting together the scriptures that is just exciting and wonderful and also just a joyous teamwork, co-laboring together effort. And I would encourage you, please, to sign up. And uh, if you haven't done so already, for some reason, it doesn't like to stay on this slide. Um, but uh, you can just go to the event page. Uh, you can see the kiosk on the welcome desk or scan that QR code. Uh, it'll take you. We are thin on Friday, or excuse me, on Saturday afternoon. And so if you could help on Saturday afternoon, that would be a great help. Any time from 12 to 4. And uh, so we have more, the morning completely filled. But the afternoon, we do have some openings uh, still. And so if you could please fill that up, that would be a great, great blessing. We're aiming at 40 people per time slot. And uh, we're excited about it and looking forward to seeing what the Lord's going to do with this as the scriptures go to a country truly that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we are thankful and privileged that we have that opportunity to get the scriptures to Malawi. And so please pray. And also, if you could help with us, that would be a great, great thing. On Friday afternoon, um, we are, uh, uh, Brother Johnson's going to be coming. We're looking at between three to five. Uh, he's aiming between three to four, um, but three to five is the time frame in which he's going to be traveling. He's going to be traveling from Kentucky, and uh, we need some uh, manpower to help move some equipment. Uh, if you remember last year, they, he has that paper cutter that weighs about 600 trillion pounds. And uh, although I could probably move it with just a finger, it would be best and advisable uh, for some additional help. Amen? Just for safety reasons, you know. And uh, so if we could have some help with that, that would be great. I know uh, Brother George said that he would be able to be a part of that. Brother George Mollis, is there anyone else? If I could have a couple of other guys, at least a couple of other guys that could help sometime between three and five, I'll let you know. Brother Reed, thank you very much. It's another, uh, anyone else that could help? Okay, Brother Steve, I appreciate that. Um, anyone else, just as a fallback for reason? Uh, Gunner, you are being, you're, you're being, uh, you're being uh, uh, just, 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 uh, 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 yeah, volunteer. Thank you very much. I knew it. It was right there. Anyway, and uh, so, yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I'll definitely connect with you um, on Friday and let you know uh, on this ETA. But it shouldn't take long, and we're looking forward to that. And so thank you so much for helping. I'm excited about all those that have already signed up. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for being a part of this. This is an incredible opportunity that we have as a church to touch missions in a very physical way. And I'm thankful for that privilege and opportunity. Amen. Thank you for being a part of that church. Just a reminder that MCA will have uh, online learning days. Um, what do you call that? Ver ver remote learning. Remote learning Thursday and Friday because the, the teachers and staff will be uh, at a conference sharpening ourselves. Amen. It's good to stop every once in a while and sharpen the axe. And uh, so the, the teachers, our school teachers will be uh, getting sharpened this week on Thursday and Friday, and so just a reminder about that remote learning. That's why we need some help uh, with this paper cutter, uh, because uh, it literally won't, there won't be many people around but Brother Williams, and so though he said he could take care of it, it'd probably be a good idea for some help, so thank you, thank you, thank you for being a part of that. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to come forward tonight, please, for our evening offering, and uh, praise the Lord. Amen. I've asked Brother Terry Frost to pray tonight, and he's down there, and I uh, appreciate him being willing to do that. And so uh, let's be faithful in our tithes and offerings. Amen? Amen. That's good. That's good. Let's be faithful, and let's do what God wants us to do. And uh, Brother Frost, would you pray for us, please, tonight? Thank you. Dear Lord, let us uh, bow our heads and pray. Uh, thank you for the uh, church that we have here. And the people that are in charge of it and run it, especially Pastor John, thank you for putting him in this place where he needed so badly. Uh, thank you for the gift and the giver and to use the offerings to further our church and continue to be strong and watch over everyone this evening and safe travels home. This we pray in your holy name. Amen.
Thank you, Brother Williams. I'm going to grab this mic, Brother George. This is, and is it dead? Mic one. Give me mic one. Test, test, test. Are we here? There we go. All right. I don't have a joke for you this evening, but I do. There is a joke within the building that I want to show you. These beautiful decorations that are on our platform are done by Miss Becky McLean back there. Would you give her a round of applause? And every time that she decorates, I don't know if you know this, but she puts a little Easter egg in our decorations. Did you know that this has been up here for weeks and weeks and weeks? We've, so every time she does decorations, you got to look for the Easter egg, all right? So give her another round of applause. And would you stand with me, please, and shake a hand with your neighbor? Make your way back to your seats, remain standing, and this time let's turn to song number 25. Song number 25, we're going to sing the song, The Wonder of It All, written back in 1957. The Wonder of It All, just to think that God loves me. It's a great song, we'll sing it through the first and the last. Sing it with me, page 25, there's a wonder. Sing it with me, there's a wonder of sunset. it with me. There's a wonder of God's revelation. The Word who dwelt amongst men. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is that Jesus is coming again. if you would go to Matthew chapter 3 please Matthew chapter 3 
We're going to start in verse number one this evening. Matthew chapter three, verse number one. We'll read just two verses as we get into things this evening. Notice what the Bible says. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you truly for the opportunity that we have to hear and to receive instruction from your word. God, thank you for your word and truly thank you that it is inexhaustible, something in which we can glean truth from time after time after time again. And God, truly, we need to hear from you tonight. We want to hear your word. And I pray that you would guide, lead us in truth, please. I pray truly that if there is one here that does not know Christ, that you truly would help them to understand their need of a Savior, and they would become a child of God tonight. And God, I pray that you would once again teach us, guide us, please. Help us to become closer to you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Woo! Woo! Yeah! Here I was just telling somebody that, oh, Brother Jones don't sing, and he rose to the challenge. Woo! Men can sing, even if they can't. This is awesome. I love it. He's been all jittery up here all evening on the platform, and he picked one of the hardest songs he could pick. So, amen. Let's, uh, let's give him this time. Amen. All right. At? Hot 
Amen. Hey, wait a minute. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. You got the nerves out. Now you got to do it again. I love it. I love it. Good job. Amen. Now there's officially nothing Brother Jones hasn't done at Shenandoah. <laughs> officially. All right. You see Brother Trumpy back here. He was smiling ear to ear. He says, I'm proud of you, my young Padawan, or whatever he said. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen, George. Come on. Amen. All right. George, thank you for making him sound good. I appreciate you. <laughs> yes, it's awesome. Amen. Matthew chapter 3, please. Matthew 3. Good job, Brother Jones. Good job. Amen. Matthew 3. Uh, praise the Lord. Here's the official. I don't know. Is it diagnosis, Bill? Is that the, is that the term? I don't know. The official. Okay. All the smoke, you, I'm kind of wondering where it was coming from. And everybody said, the speakers are on fire. And I thought it was too. I looked up here and I saw that smoke just lingering by that one speaker. And uh, it was the fan out of one of our uh, HVAC units. All right, So the fan burned up and then blew a bunch of smoke out. And so praise the Lord. And uh, Bill said he'd take it out of his salary. So praise God. <laughs> and uh, we'll just take care of that thing. So praise the Lord for it. Amen. All right, so we'll get that replaced, and uh, again, church, I can't thank you enough for just being uh, level-headed and, and just, uh, just calm through all that, and God was glorified, and people's lives were changed today because we didn't react in the flesh, and so thank you so very, very much. Matthew chapter 3, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Lord, be glorified by this tonight, and Holy Spirit, you bring out what you want, please. May your uh, will be accomplished, and may you, Lord, allow the thought, the, the scripture, Lord, the uh, things that uh, you want brought out, would you bring them out tonight, please. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. John the Baptist is uh, a little bit special to me. Because John the Baptist was my name for the last 15 years, 14 years. Um, when I was in Michigan, obviously many of you know that I joined the fire department up there. And uh, in the first training that I went to, I, I came in and the chief looked at me and said, your name's John. You're a Baptist preacher. So you're John the Baptist and you're our new chaplain. And so I said, Okay. Well, if you're just going to throw it in my lap, I take it. I, I got this thing. So I was joining to be a firefighter just because they needed help. And then uh, when he gave me the, uh, the ability to be the chaplain, I was all over that. And praise God. God used it. I was able to pray and help a lot of folks in the community, pray with. I got to witness to so many. I got to do so many funerals uh, where I was given the gospel regularly. And praise God, people got saved. And uh, so John the Baptist is just something near and dear to my heart. Uh, because it, I got labeled that not from my own self, from the outside world. And the world called me that. And I said, man, praise God for that. And I used that. And uh, even started a business, JTB, Ground Maintenance. And so that was, I honestly, I did. It's just, it was fun. So anyways, when I'm preaching about John the Baptist, it's, it's special to me. I just think about that a little bit. And so John the Baptist, the forerunner here of Christ. And praise the Lord for it. He's... Uh, He's actually related to the Lord Jesus. If you, if you didn't know that from Scripture, if you look in Luke chapter 1, remember Mary, the mother of Jesus, was cousins with Elizabeth, who was John the Baptist's mother. So if they, the mamas were cousins, that make Jesus and John the Baptist second cousins. Now, I have it because Hollywood always messes things up. I saw this ancient movie when I was a kid that... Uh, uh, I think it was like King of Kings or something like that. And John the Baptist was this real old guy. He was a really old guy. But did you know he's only six months older than the Lord Jesus? He's only six months older. And, uh, and so you think about that. He was preaching and people were coming to hear him preach. And he was preaching hard against Herod and his, his wife there and all that. And they took his head off as a young man. I mean, early 30s. Uh, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God being used of God. Amen. And so tonight, now help me church, help me now. What has Matthew's theme been? What, what is Matthew portraying Christ as? King, that's exactly right, king. And then in chapter 1 we saw, behold your king. He was introducing 
uh, the king to the Jewish people that were waiting for that king to come. And then in chapter 2, we looked at adore the true king, where we saw Herod, the fake king, the false king that was on the throne that shouldn't have been there, and, and Christ, the true king, right? And now in chapter 3, with John the Baptist, we're introduced to the king's ambassador, the king's ambassador. And so it says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, Brother Gwen, I think about that a little bit, the wilderness. That word wilderness th- uh, means lonesome. It doesn't necessarily mean desert, but yet there is desert in Judea. If you were to go east of Jerusalem down towards the Dead Sea, that was once the well-watered plains of Jordan and all that, but because of Sodom and Gomorrah and that judgment, it's no longer. It's a desert place. The southern part of the Jordan River into the Dead Sea, just along the east side of Jerusalem there uh, leading up to that, it is deserty. That would be one place, if you remember, David hid in caves from Saul. Remember that? There's a place called En Gedi, where Dave, there was a spring coming out of the ground there, and uh, David hid there. This would be the wilderness of Judea. Now, it's very interesting when I consider that, because we're going to get to it, but the Bible says these people came out to hear him. That's backwards. He didn't go to them, they came to him. It's very, very interesting as I read this. Let's keep going. Verse 2. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye. All right? So he's calling people for repentance. What is repentance? To turn back. To to about face. It's a military term, right? You put your foot like that and you turn around, right? About face. And, uh, And he's calling people to turn back to the Lord For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is that? Kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heavens. That where the heavenly rule would be on earth. That's the idea with this. Kingdom of heaven. What were the Jews looking for? What were they waiting for? They were waiting for the Messiah, the king, to come and take rule. I won't be like Pastor Don, Mrs. Smith. I almost fell right there. I won't be like him. All right? I heard he fell down the stairs one time and had a good time. All right. I won't do that. All right. So I'll pay attention. Maybe I'll just back up. Amen. <laughs> Listen, he, they were waiting for the king to come and set up his earthly rule on the earth, conquer Rome, and be that conquering hero over, over Rome, right? So John the Baptist is preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hmm. at hand. What does that mean? Near. Getting close. Right here. It's, it's right here. I can grab onto it. How can that be if the earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ is not for, it hadn't even happened yet? But see, remember, the Jews, they're thinking about Daniel's timeline. They're thinking about that 70 weeks And that last week is that tribulation time, but they didn't see the church age, right? That mystery, remember? And so there's actually a break in that timeline between week 69 and week 70. Amen. And so the first advent of Christ is part of that timeline when we're introduced to the Lord Jesus. He had to come first and be rejected and be crucified. Amen. That had to happen. So we're introduced to him But listen, no matter if the Lord is sitting on his throne in Jerusalem or if he's in the heavens, God still rules over all. He's still the king of kings. And so John the Baptist is preaching, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What he's saying is, get ready. The Messiah's coming. The king is coming. Jesus is coming. Get ready. He's coming any minute. He's the forerunner of Christ. Now notice the text here. Notice it, verse 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, that's Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, that word crying, not weeping, not not begging uh, uh, or sorrowful, but crying as in shouting, crying out, Behold, a herald, the king comes, the king is coming. The, 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 the kingdom is about us. It's, it's at hand, right? 
But I want you to notice here what he's quoting is out of Isaiah 40. Would you keep your finger here and go with me back to Isaiah chapter 40, please? Isaiah chapter 40, please. Here Matthew is saying that, that John the Baptist is the, revelation, is the fulfillment of the prophecy of this forerunner that's crying in the, in the wilderness. This one that would come before Christ and proclaim his coming. Matthew here is saying that John the Baptist is this person. Now John himself in, John, in the apostle, the gospel according to John, John the Baptist himself said, I am this man. And he was full of the Holy Ghost and believed that to be accurate. Okay, look at Isaiah 40 verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. He didn't cry in the city. He cried in the wilderness. That's interesting. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, highway is important there. Now, I underlined that word because I'm studying and trying to understand it. What I know from research a little bit, from studying this, Old Testament times, whenever there was a marching army coming on to another place, they would send out an ambassador or a messenger ahead of the army. And the, and the messenger would go before and he would say, the army's coming, the army's coming. Remember, you've seen some, sometimes reenactments of things where one guy's carrying a flag, announcing this is who we are. Well, in these times, there would be a herald or a messenger or an ambassador that would go out ahead of the army and it would prepare people for the coming army. Now, literally, what they would do is, is physically they would make changes to prepare for this massive army. Okay, the army's marching, they would literally level down the hills. They would cut the hills down and they would fill in the valleys to make it easier to pass for a marching army. Maybe they're carrying carts and buggies or whatever the case, ammunition things uh, and, and, and different, different, whatever you want to call it in our day, artillery, right? They're carrying all this stuff. And uh, they're making it easier for the army to pass through the land. They're also, also perfecting the turns and making it more simple for the army and uh, transitions into different things. They're preparing that. They're also preparing food and getting people to acknowledge that there's an army coming and we must be ready for that. Okay? So if you're considering that Isaiah in the Old Testament, that's what they're talking about. That's what they've got pictured in their heads. But John the Baptist is saying... It's the Messiah, the King of Kings, the one that's been prophesied about. He's coming. So prepare your hearts for the Lord. Get ready. He's coming. And he's talking here to Jews. He's talking to the Jews and he's saying, the one that you learned about while you were growing up, the prophecy of Isaiah and Daniel and others that the Messiah that is coming, he is, it's upon us. He's here. And what he was doing was he was turning the people back to the Lord. What John the Baptist was doing, honestly, folks, you've heard about revival meetings where it's time for God's people to set everything else aside and let's, get, let's hear from the Lord and let's have some true revival and let's use this altar and pour our hearts out to God and get right. That's what John the Baptist was all about. That's what he's doing. He's preaching that Jesus is coming. One of... Uh, what, something I love to preach about, and you probably know because I've referenced it quite a bit, is the rapture. I'm looking forward to Jesus coming. If it could be that I don't have to die and I could just be raptured up, that sounds like a good thing. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, I know there's a lot of people in here, and some of these young ladies are saying, just let me get married first. Let me have my first baby. Right? The guys are like, let me get a license. I want to drive. Amen. Right? But listen. God can come anytime. Amen. All that's passed. Praise the Lord. Amen. God can come anytime. And, and the Bible says he will. He, he can, can come anytime. So we got to be ready for that. That's exactly what John the Baptist is preaching here. Jesus is coming. Make ready. Make ready. Make ready. All right. And so let's continue on here. When it says straight there, it means level and true. Level and true. That can mean physically with the ground that they're marching on. It can also mean time-wise that get, it's, it's upon us now. we got to do this now. Okay? Look at verse 4. 
And the same John had in his raiment uh, of camel hair and of a, a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. John the Baptist is an amazing man here. He, he doesn't make himself to be something. He's about being humble and doing his Lord's business, Lord, doing the Lord's work. If, you, if I can explain it this way, the camel's hair was not anything finely made and, and worked on a long time. It was literally the coarse, rough hair of a camel. And it was a, it was a, a garment that he would put on uh, over top of him, and then he'd take a leather, leather belt and literally wrap it together and tie it on so it would be secured over him. It was the, it was the clothing of a servant. That's what it was. It wasn't expensive. It wasn't great. It wasn't what the Greeks were going after and what the Romans were going after. It wasn't any kind of linen. It was rough. It was not, uh, it was not the most comfortable thing. And it was just cheap. It was simple. It was cheap clothing. But then notice his, his food, locusts and wild honey. Anybody want to eat that? Anybody ever tried a, a chocolate locust or grasshopper or nothing? No? You have? Did you enjoy it? Okay, well, he's going to eat it then. All right, good. <laughs> Listen, this, this food here, this food here is literally poor people's food. It's, it's a lot of even servants didn't eat this. He's living off the land, and he's, he's just eating what's available to him. He's in the wilderness. He's in a lonesome place, uh, and he's just eating whatever he can. He's, he's choosing a servant kind of life, a simple life. Now, here's what's amazing about that. John the Baptist, here's what I didn't think about when I was studying this. John the Baptist had the ability to have a different life. I want you to consider that for a minute. Do you remember who his father was? His father was a priest in the temple. If you remember that, remember daddy was in the temple, and, and was it Gabriel that came to him and told him he was going to have a son, and he, he didn't believe it at first, and God made him not talk anymore because of that? Luke chapter 1. I challenge you to go back and read it. And so daddy was a priest in the temple, and that means he was of the lineage of Aaron, and that means John the Baptist was, and he could have had a whole different life. But God told him, you go prepare the way of the Lord. You preach, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and you go out and be that one crying in the wilderness. That's what God told him to do. Now listen. Great application here. It doesn't matter how great we can be and what we, all of this and what we have ambitions for. Don't do your ambitions. Follow God's will. And God will make you to be something great. John the Baptist was a great preacher. The people greatly respected him so much that Herod was, was afraid to kill him. Remember that? Because the people loved him. And they came out to hear him. They, he didn't go to the streets banging on the doors. He was in the wilderness, and they came out to him. What a preacher for people to come out in the wilderness and hear this guy preach. And he's not some uh, great evangelist, TV evangelist guy with rings on his finger. He's simply dressed, servant-type look, but he must have been able to let it, let it rip. Amen? He must have just lit on fire and let him have it. And when he was preaching at Herod, no wonder his wife got all angry at him. What do, you, what do you want? Well, get his head. Get his head. No wonder, because that guy could preach, and people would follow him. Amen? Wouldn't it be great if we get some young men that learn how to preach and are unashamed to preach the truth of the Word of God and what God told them to preach, no matter whose toes it steps on. Now, I'm not for offending people just for offending people, but I am for doing what God said no matter what. Amen? Amen? There's a, there's a prophet, and I have a hard time pronouncing his name. He's in the book of the Kings, and, uh, and the, the, there's the, it starts with an M. It's Micaiah or something like that. I have a hard time pronouncing it. But he says, I will deliver what the Lord has given me. I will preach what God told me to preach. I'm not going to preach what you want me to preach. The king wanted him to give, tell him something nice. Uh, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was Ahab and maybe Jehoshaphat, if I'm not mistaken. I might have that wrong. But there was, a, there was a prophet, and his, na his, his name was an M, and he says, I'm going to preach what God told me to preach. Amen and amen. We get some young men that will do that. Praise the Lord. 
Let's continue in the, in the scripture here. Verse 5, I've already spoke about it. Then went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. All right, now let's think about this. John the Baptist is baptizing people. Amen. But Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. So why is he baptizing? Interesting. This is Old Testament mentality. We've got to know that. I know it's New Testament. It's Matthew. But Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. The new covenant hasn't come about yet. And, and uh, uh, this is before the time of Christ. He's preaching in an Old Testament setting. You understand that? Jesus hadn't even, he hadn't even started his earthly ministry yet. And he's preaching that people turn back to the Lord. And so what they do on the outside is a, of their baptism is a picture of what they're doing on the inside, repenting to the Lord. Amen. Okay? Don't get confused by this now. It's a different time era. It is not the age of grace yet. It's not the church age. And, and we have different instructions in the church age that when you get saved, you get baptized, and it's once and done. Now, John the Baptist was a different age, and he's baptizing because people, Jewish people, that knew the truth, that knew they were supposed to be expecting the Messiah, they're turning back to him. They're repenting and turning back to God, saying, yes, let me see the Messiah come. I'm, I'll be ready for it. And on the outside, they're getting baptized just to say, my old life is being put away. And my new, I'm now walking in a new life. I'm walking in a life of repentance for God, and I'm waiting to see his Messiah. Amen. What a great thought. What a great thought. Now, there are people today that desire to get baptized for experience sake. That's wrong. I was in Israel in 2011, and I'm at the Jordan River, and because uh, my name was Pastor John, people wanted me to baptize them, and they asked me. And I said, wait a minute, have you even been saved? And second of all, we ain't with the church. What are we doing here? Amen? It's like, you're just looking for an experience. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. And some other guy, some Southern Baptist preacher, decided to baptize him. And he baptized him in the name of what John the Baptist in repentance. And I, I struggled with that greatly. And I said, man, I think you're off base. You're leading people astray here. Because they're ba you're baptizing them on a, on a sensation or emotion or, or an experience to say, I got baptized in the Jordan River. And uh, not in a heart of repentance and not a heart of salvation. And so let's not lead people astray there. It was a different time era at this time. Let's continue. Verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, Oh, generation of vipers. Whew. Can you imagine that? Oh, generation of vipers. Arr! You old, you snakes, you serpents, um, you hypocrites, amen? He's just going after them. Man, I, wanna, I don't want him preaching at me. I want to just watch, all right? I want to be the guy over here just watching. He's going after them. I love it. And he's not scared either. Remember, these, some of these men, they're, they're much his senior, and they got influence, and they got power, and they got money. And John the Baptist, just a simple man living off the land, and he's preaching hard at them. He's calling them snakes. Amen. Now, what's that mean when he calls them a snake? Generation of vipers. Generation is an offspring. Who's the snake? That's Satan. Jesus said the same thing. You're of, the, you're, you're of a child of a devil. You're of your father the devil who's a liar. And John the Baptist called them children of the devil right here. And, uh, man, he's just getting after them. He's going to, going to town. But notice it says the Pharisees and Sadducees. Two different groups of people here. See, in this time, we don't read much, we don't read about them in the Old Testament. We do read about them in the New Testament. The Pharisees were a, a sect, a S E C T, a sect of the Jews. And the Pharisees were called the separatists by everybody else. They separated themselves from the liberal theology of the day, the, the guys that were going the way of the Greeks and the guys that were coming away from the law, and they considered themselves to be the guardians of the law. 
They were the ones that were going to be the guys that made sure they had every T crossed and every I dotted of the law. They were not going to move an ounce away from Jewish tradition and the, and the Moses, uh, Moses law and any of that. They were going to stay true to it. The problem is they did it so much that they were self-righteous. They were self-righteous. They looked at themselves like, we've got it together. Don't worry about us. And how so much pride came into that and we keep so many of them from turning to Christ. Amen and amen. Sadducees were different. They were the other side of the spectrum. The Sadducees were the, were the people with more money and more power. They were the ones that every opportunity they had to gain a position, they were going after it. They were the liberal mentality of the day. They were the ones that were accepting the Greek culture and the Greek sin that came with that. They were the ones that were straying from the law a little bit to make sure they could get a position, they could get power. We see the, both these people today. And the problem is, is remember this, we're not careful, we're going the way of man's wisdom. If Even if we try to stay true to the law, I've, you've seen people and I've seen people, they're so true and so stuck on, I want to do everything just right, and they're, and they're forcing it in their flesh that I'm not going to get anything on my outside appearance wrong. I'm going to have it just right. But their heart is cold. Their heart is cold. And then you see people just getting saved, and they're so on fire for God, and they want it, and they're soaking it in. And they're still smoking cigarettes, and they still smell like alcohol, and they don't know, and they're listening to all kinds of music out here in the church parking lot, but they're excited, and they're growing. That's a big difference, isn't it? Big difference. Be careful of man's wisdom. Be careful of that now. All right. As we go here, uh, let's continue along. Look at verse 8. He says, here he's preaching. He's preaching at these Pharisees and these Sadducees. They've come to his baptism. In other words, down to the river when he's baptizing converts. Not converts, excuse me, but people of repentance. Okay? And he says to them. Let me start in the, halfway through the previous verse, verse 7. Who hath warned you? To flee from the wrath to come. Who told you to come out here? Who told you to flee from the wrath? Now the Jews didn't think that they were going to see that wrath. They thought, well, God's just going to save me from this. They really didn't understand that. that they missed where Jeremiah talked about the, the time of Jacob's trouble. The tribulation time. And he says in verse 8, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. In other words... If what you're saying is true and you want to repent, then show me that. Show me a life that is true. That it's not, you're not just saying something. Show me that heart right there that's real, being repentant before God. And that's what he's saying here. It's not a, it's not a work salvation that he's going after. But when we are saved, Philippians tells us to work out your own salvation. That, that Ephesians chapter 2, if I'm not mistaken, says we are his workmanship created unto good works. So if we're saved, we're a new creature in Christ, we ought to be doing good works. We ought to be showing it on the outside. We ought to be showing that we're Christians if it's real in the inside. And he's saying here to these, these people, they've come to be known of the religious people. The, the, the people that are having a revival down here, they went to the Billy Graham crusade and saw the people getting saved, right? And they want to be counted with that number. And he says, whoa, are you really repenting or are you just out here for show? Because it don't look like you're repenting. Show me some proof. Show me a life. Show me a heart that is true. Amen. Amen. Now, God, only God sees that heart. We understand that. Man looks on the outward appearance, isn't that what the Bible says? But God looks on the heart. Amen. Let's be careful, folks. Let's be careful there, please. Let's just take a moment. God's bringing us out a little bit. We're not the judge. Amen. We're not the judge. You're not. I'm not. I don't care if I'm the pastor, if you're a deacon, or if you've been in this church 119 years. You're not the judge. There's one judge, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So let me not be judgmental on some person that's in the church that's saying this and doing this. God knows their heart. I don't. Sometimes I have to discern and try to teach, but I'm not to be judgmental. 
Not to look down on people and talk about them. Now this and this and this is what I think. Be careful on that. Be careful. God says, don't be judged. You're not the judge. Amen. You got to be careful on that. We're real good at being judgmental, aren't we? Making little comments and little. Yeah, we're real good at that. But God says we're not the judge. Amen and amen. Let's move on. Verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. They thought they were really something because they were Jews. They thought that they were privileged because they were Jews. Now, they were a special people. But they, every person's got to repent on their own selves, their own hearts. Amen. God will not save you because your grandma will save you. Amen. God will not count you as being righteous just because you have a grandma or a mommy that, that, that is holy on, on the outside. We're not, we're not just ushered right in to, because we associate with somebody. It's individual decisions. Amen. And that's what he's going after here. Look at verse 10. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I want you to consider a big tree for a minute. Think about a big, massive tree. It's been there for decades and decades, and it's big, and it's big and around. And, it, and trees ought to produce fruit. They ought, to, they ought to have some kind of bud, some kind of something that grows off them. They don't produce fruit, then what good are they, right? That's what he's saying here. And, and Israel has a lot of trees, a lot of different types of fruit. I remember being over there and watching figs grow right off a fig tree. Well, that was neat because I love fig newtons. Amen. <laughs> All right, good. Fig newtons are good. I don't know why I'm talking about that. Amen. Moving on. So think about a big tree, kind of like a person that's lived life for several decades. I'm here. I'm accomplished. I'm rooted. Look at me. And God says here, if there's no fruit, let's hew it down. Mm. If there's no fruit, let's, let's take the ax to it. Now, notice the text here. The axe is laid under the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. God knows if you're real and genuine or not. Doesn't matter. Again, I'm not the judge. You're not the judge. God knows your heart and if you're real or not. Amen. There is coming an accountability time when every person will stand before God. Amen. I pray that all of us in this room... Stand before the judgment seat of Christ and not the great white throne judgment. That means that you're saved and that God will reward you for your life on earth after your salvation. But understand that every person will stand before God. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to know that and be a little bit accountable. Look at verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So John is saying, I baptize you. I'm not the judge. You're coming to me, but hey, I'll baptize you, but there's one coming that is much mightier than I, and he knows your heart, and you're going to be accountable to him. He's talking about Jesus. Yeah. So when he says here that I'm not worthy to bear his shoes, literally shoes in those days, were a sandal. It was a piece of wood underneath the bottom of your foot with leather straps. And what would happen is when they went into a home, they would take those shoes off. And when they were leaving the home, they'd put those shoes back on. And it was the lowest servant of the home, the lowest servant of that place that would assist people in taking off their shoes or putting them back on. And what John is saying here, because in, uh, I believe it's, let me see here. I believe it's Mark chapter 1, if you want to look that up later. He says this in a different way. He says, I'm not worthy to latch his shoe or something along the line of, of buckling it together. And what he's saying, it's not bearing, it's not carrying the shoe, but I'm not even worthy to take his shoe off and to put it back on. That's what he's saying. And that is the truth. John the Baptist was a humble man, and we can learn from that. Make application. Here's a fiery preacher full of the Holy Ghost from, the, from birth, 
that God said, he'll be my forerunner for Christ. And this man was humble enough to say, I must decrease and he must increase. I think he said it backwards. He must increase and I must decrease. But either way, John chapter 1. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Here's a man that could preach, that could draw the crowd, that had the ability to be something because his daddy was a priest. And yet he was a humble man saying, I'm going to do the will of God and I'm not worthy to even associate myself with the Savior, but God's will be done. Amen. Amen. Let you and I be that way. It is so easy, church, church family, it's so easy for us as Christians to get prideful about ourselves. But God, amen, I've been in that church all my life. Amen. Don't you tell me about that. I know what I'm talking about. And we just get so prideful in our hearts. And that pride cometh before destruction. Amen and amen. If we, I'm church family, honestly, I'm telling you, you're a preacher right here first and foremost. You know that the thing is, if you want to have revival, you draw, take a piece of chalk and draw a circle on the ground and be the first one to step in. You want your church to have revival? It's me that's got to have revival. Listen, your, fa- your tr- preacher included, if we would get our pride confessed and right in this church, we get a lot accomplished for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we, as Americans, and we, as Shenandoahans, that have been here forever, right, we are awfully prideful many, many times. Amen and amen. Praise God for it that we would recognize that and get right with God. Because God hates our stinking pride. Amen. Let's move on from that. He says here in verse 11, of course, he's, un, he's unworthy. Notice the last verse, or excuse me, the last phrase of the verse. He says, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Wow. John's saying, I'm baptizing you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. Who's he, who's he preaching at? Is he preaching at believers or unbelievers? I think he's preaching at both of them. Because Jesus is coming, and he's going to save you, and he's going to give you that Holy Spirit of God. Listen, there's a, lot of, there's a big group of people out there today that believe that being baptized by the Holy Ghost is something extra and some kind of experience that you look for after salvation. That's not of the Bible. Please understand that's not of the Bible. In the book of Acts, we see that uh, very minimally as a transitional book because the people of Acts, the first few chapters in Acts, they were alive when Jesus died on the cross. They, they had, they, all of this was brand new. They, got, they, got, they believed on Christ for salvation, and then after Jesus' death, he says, when I leave, I'm, bring, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. So the beginning of the book of Acts, we cannot take that and take all our, our doctrine and theology from that and say, yes, this is what I'm doing. It was a transitional time, and Jesus explained that. We have then Romans and all the epistles, 1 and 2 Corinthians, come on, Galatians, the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the Thessalonians, all of those. The pastoral epistles that, de- that teach us about the church and about the church age. And that's where we get our instruction from. Amen. The book of Acts is a book of history. Amen. It's the book of history in the New Testament. And we must understand that. And so when he's baptizing us with the Holy Ghost, that happens at salvation. God said very rightfully so. He said in Romans, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken here, I believe it's Romans 8, 9. And I have it down here in my notes somewhere. I believe that's true. Romans 8, 9. He says, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're a none of His. If you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, you're not saved. And we must understand that. So when somebody says, well, I got saved, but then I really got baptized with the Holy Spirit. No, it happened at the same time. Because that's what the Bible teaches. And Paul's teaching that in Romans, that if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, then you're not saved. Because that was his promise. That was his promise. Amen. With fire, obviously the Lord, Holy, the Holy Spirit of God, when we have him, he burns within us. Amen. And he convicts us of sin. But I believe that's also talking about that those that do not have Jesus Christ, their only, their only destiny is hell. 
This is hellfire. So I believe he's really talking to both here. Continue on, verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, what he's speaking of here is the threshing floor. Remember the Old Testament threshing floor? They've, they've harvested the wheat. The wheat is laying on the ground. The animals are treading over the wheat, breaking the, excuse me, the uh, grain away from the, the chaff and away from all of that, right? And then the fan is literally like a flat shovel. And they put that they shovel in there and they throw it up in the air. And they'd usually do this up on a hill or, or an open place. And when they show it up, throw it up in the air, I talked to you about this recently. And that, that grain is heavy, it would fall back down, and the chaff would be blown away in the wind. And so he's separating the grain from the chaff here. And uh, rightfully so, he's talking about separating those that believe from those that don't believe. And the chaff will be, look what it says here, will burn up in unquenchable fire. If you're, dealt, if you're doubting the fire of hell, you need to read your Bible. It's real, it's true, and if you're unsaved, the Bible says your destiny, your, where you're headed is the fire of hell. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 that hell, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire where the, the worm dieth not, where the flame is not quenched. Jesus Christ preached heavily on hell because he didn't want people to go there. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter if you've been in this church a long time, if you've got one of those names, a charter membership of Shenandoah from years ago, if you were over on Albert Street, or if you rode the bus three decades ago, it doesn't matter. If you're unsaved, you need to get saved or you're going to hell. Amen. Well, but what are people going to think? I've been in this church forever. Hell is forever. Well, hell's cast in the lake of fire, but that torment is forever. Amen. Don't mess with that thing. Let's continue. We're, we're wrapping up here. Then cometh Jesus, we're in verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be, now, to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him somebody help me tonight did jesus need to be baptized isn't baptism a picture of a heart being being saved before god being being well in john the baptist day of a heart turning back to the lord did jesus need to repent no he was god so why did he get baptized great reason great uh, question isn't it Man, Matthew got me with a good question tonight down here. I was trying to answer it. I like it. Children ask questions and adults ask questions and stump the preacher. Man, I love it. I got to think on that one a little bit more, Matthew. Appreciate you. Amen. But listen, did, if Jesus didn't need to be baptized, then why did he get baptized? There's a lot, a, lot of good, a lot of good answers coming out now. Jesus had not began his earthly ministry yet. He's about to begin it. I believe there's multiple reasons why he got baptized, but this is my opinion. What I'm about to give you is my opinion. It's not something the Bible says. I'm just giving you opinion as I, as I consider this. I'm saying that on purpose because I preach about don't follow people's opinions just because. You determine what you think and what you believe according to Scripture. Now, that being said, I believe Jesus was first off associating with his forerunner. He says, I believe in John. John's a preacher. He's preaching about me. I believe he came to John on purpose. Secondly, he was about to begin his earthly ministry, and I believe there was an anointing there, really. I mean, when, when you look at the Old Testament, the priest bathed before he was anointed for service. And Jesus was coming down. He got baptized by John, and the Holy Spirit might have just anointed him for that purpose at that time. See, the word Messiah in the Hebrew and the word Christ in the Greek both mean the anointed one. Very interesting. But he also came as an example, I believe, and somebody was saying that tonight, but uh, an example to believers. Hey, I want to associate with these people that, I'm, that are waiting for my return, are waiting for me to come. Now, verse 16, 
And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. A few little thoughts here and then we'll close. All right? Notice in verse 16, I underlined this because I didn't want to miss it. Out of the water. How did he come out of the water if he wasn't in the water? When Jesus got baptized, he went in and got dunked. He was in the Jordan and he went in there and John said, whoop, and put him under. Amen? He didn't sprinkle him. He didn't throw water at him. He didn't slap him with it. He come up out of the water, the Bible says. And I believe that's important to see that because there's still a lot of folks that, that believe in this sprinkling stuff and it's not, it's not Bible. Jesus said, I'm getting baptized, I'm going in. Because when Jesus washed me as white as snow, he didn't just do a little bit, he didn't just do my forehead, he did all of me. And he did it completely, amen. And uh, notice that when here it says, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him and he saw. I wonder, is that John seeing that or Jesus seeing that? Because remember when Stephen was preaching and he was about to, be, he was about to die and they're stoning him, the Bible says he looked up and he saw into heaven. Heavens were opened unto him. I wonder if that's John or what, but it doesn't matter here. The Trinity of God, the Father's voice was heard. The Spirit of God was seen in the, as a dove, and Jesus is right there in front of him. Praise the Lord for it. I don't know in the Old Testament, uh, there, it might be, but when I think about it, I don't know another time that the Trinity is all together and seen like that till back at Genesis 1. I'm thinking about when, let, when God said, let us make man in our own image, image. But there might have been another time, but I'm not recalling it right now. And I'll have to think about that later. And many, I'm sure many of you probably, if you, there is one, you'll come up and tell me. I, I ask you to do that. Now, and lo, the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That very voice, I think this is so neat. I'll say this, I'll be done. That very voice was the same voice that Peter heard on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's the voice of God the Father. And according to Peter, in 1 Peter or 2 Peter, I think it's 1 Peter, the end of the book, he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy than that very voice I heard from heaven. You know what he was talking about? Talking about the Bible. He said, the voice of God I heard come down out of heaven I have something even greater. Because the book of Psalms says he magnifies his word above his name. And we take it for granted. And we cast it aside. And we don't read it and we don't know it. And God says of himself, he says, I've taken my word and I've magnified it above my name. Amen and amen. A lot of great applications tonight. Maybe we would be an ambassador for Christ like John the Baptist. Maybe we would be unashamed to preach the whole truth and whatever God gives us and not fear men's faces. Maybe we would be some that would say, you know what, it doesn't matter about all these extra things out there that I can get and attain to. I'm going to do the Father's will. I'm going to be that one preaching because God called me to do that. And God's not calling everybody to be a preacher, but God's calling you to do something. Yes. Remember this morning I was talking, I was preaching about how some believe in predestination, predestination, that they believe that some are predestined to be saved and others not to be saved, Ephesians chapter 1. The, the context of that is not salvation. The context of that is, one, is, is serving Jesus Christ in a way he predestined me to be a pastor. He said that when I got saved, he, got, he had a job for me. He had a will for my life. And it's a, it's a predestination of service, not of salvation. You read the context in there, that's what it's talking about. That's why I said be careful about taking a verse outside of the context and trying to develop a, a, a doctrine off of it. Don't do that thing. Lord, help us tonight. Thank you for the word of God and the truth of your scripture tonight. God, may we be ambassadors for you. May we be more like John who said, I must decrease, but he must increase. And God, may we be putting our pride aside, not being judgmental of others, but just saying, Lord, this is the will of God for my life, and I'm going to do it. 
And Lord, may we not fear men's faces. Help us tonight, Lord. And challenge us as believers tonight to follow the will of God for our lives. Thank you for the example of John. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for using him. And uh, Lord, what a great, great man, a great example. And I pray we'd be more like him. Thank you for it, Lord. As the invitation uh, opens tonight, I ask you if you'd stand to your feet. The piano is going to play. And let's talk to the Lord tonight. What is God poking on your heart about tonight? Maybe about surrendering to His will. Maybe about being more open to what God has for you. Maybe about uh, not being so prideful and so stuck on ourselves and position and, and all of this. What is it that God is talking to you about? Let's respond tonight, please. Let's respond. Thank you so much for hearts that desire to do your will. God, we have a sweet group of people here tonight that serve you so faithfully every Sunday. Lord, they work all throughout this ministry doing so many different things to serve you. Lord, help us not to just be servants on Sunday. Help us every single day to say, I want to do the Father's will. I want to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in my life so he gets the preeminence. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit of God to fill me and use me to do that very thing. Lord, may we be like John the Baptist who was filled with the Spirit. God, we have that ability. We, you gave us your Spirit. You desire us to be filled with the Spirit. But we've got to get up here, Lord, on the altar and just, just pour out our pride before you, Lord, and empty ourselves of ourselves. Get out of the way and say, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do it. Whatever you want, Lord, here it is. God, you want my eyes? Here, here they are. You want my ears? You want my speech, my words, my thoughts? Lord, you want my dress or my music or, or you want my life choices or my college or, or, or the person I'm dating or whatever it be, Lord. Or you want uh, what I think about my children and how I raise them or, or, God, what I'm doing at work. Lord, I pray that we would empty ourselves and say it's not about what I want and what I, what I think. It's all about what God wants to do through me. And I pray we'd be more like a John the Baptist, full of the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you for this great example. Thank you for church people tonight. We have genuine hearts before you. We love you and we give you thanks and we ask your blessing as we close the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, church family. Uh, Brother Jones, you had a lot of announcements today and they're all good. If you need to hear them, go back and watch today. Amen. There's lots of good ones in there. Okay. All right. Here's what we're going to do. It's time for a church vote and we're going to be quick with this thing. Um, I'm going to ask everybody who is not a member of our church or is under the age of 18 to please go on out of the sanctuary. The, the, um, it's wet outside so that all that stuff's not open. Just hang out in the foyer for a quick minute. And then I'm going to ask church family to be seated. And I'm going to ask Brother Shank to come, if you would, to pray over this, please, our, our deacon vote tonight. And I'm going to ask ushers to go ahead and start passing out, please, the ballots tonight. Start passing out the ballots. Throw that picture back up, please, if you would, Brother Timmerman, please, of the deacons tonight. We are, de we are voting on Brother Dale Gaylor and Brother Adam Grant. There's two, listen, listen please, let me, let me have your attention. There are two open seats in the deacons, and there are two men that have been prayed over, and I'm asking you to say yay or nay on these men. It is not one seat, one or the other, it's two seats and two men. We're voting to approve this, okay? And so, Brother Shank, would you come give us any words that you want to give us and then pray over this, and then we'll take our vote, please. Thank you. You know, two good men. Uh, 
as a deacon board, we each questioned and talked about them, prayed about them. And these two men were, were the choice men that we chose, Brother Gaylor and Brother Grant. And they're very godly men. We've, uh, they've been here in our church now for several years. And uh, they proved themselves. Amen. And so uh, we need to add two to our deacon board, you know, for the love feast and the, and the widows that we have. We have, what, I think close to 40 widows. Over 40. Yeah, over 40. And so we need their help. So uh, we're going to pray and ask the Lord to help us here tonight. Father, we thank you that we can come together. We thank you, Lord, for our church. We thank you for our people. And God, now we come to this serious matter of, Lord, uh, choosing deacons to add to our deacon board, a very serious matter. And God, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to, to uh, follow your will tonight, Lord, that our people... Uh, Lord, would decide that you would speak to their hearts in a special way. We thank you for Brother Gaylor. We thank you for Brother Grant and their families, their wives, their children. They've set a good example. And God, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to, to approve them tonight. And God, I ask that you would just be with us in a special way now as we vote. And we'll thank you and praise you and give you glory. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask, well, I need one, and Brother Shank probably needs one. Amen. Brother Shank, there you go, sir. All right. Here's what I ask you to do. Mark each one, please. And then if you would, just fold that in half, and we'll send them, in just a moment, we'll send them out to the outside of the pew. Okay? The, the, uh, the inside pews here, send them this way, please. And then... Uh, Send them towards the inside, the other, other two rows. Send them towards the inside, and then uh, we'll have uh, men go along and collect them. All right? We've got a hand up. Do you need one, Dad? Okay, we need a ballot back here, please. Yeah. Anybody else need one? Any, uh, anyone else? Sarah, do you need one, Miss Tennant? Did you get one? You got one. Okay. All right. If you're watching by way of Internet, you guys still got that going? Still going? Okay, if they're watching a way of internet and you didn't call in, you have a whopping about 10 seconds to call in, please. <laughs> okay, amen. All right, good. Give your name and who you vote for, please. please. Amen. All right, Brother Williams, do you need to say anything? You okay? You good? All right. He's the mastermind behind this. He makes it all work. He's going to, uh, him and a couple of deacons are going to count that. Appreciate him. Last chance. Anybody need a ballot? Okay, pass them in towards the center, please, uh, of, your, of your pew. And uh, anybody got one still in their hand that needs to be collected? Anybody? All right. Brother Williams, um, why don't you come and just dismiss us in prayer. And then don't forget, uh, Miss Holly, where's she at? She's in the back. She's in the office. Is there a, does she have a meeting tonight? Is there a meeting tonight for special music? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Guys, I didn't hear about that. I'm sorry? Yes, she's on the phone. Okay. All right. All right. Let's pr you pray for us and dismiss us, and then uh, uh, we'll let you know about this count. Amen. If you want to know, come Wednesday night. Praise God. Amen. All right. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again for the good day. Thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to uh, truly invest in the Word of God. And God, it is never truly uh, 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 something that we uh, uh, need to take lightly that we've heard the Word of God as we heard tonight. Truly, you exalt your word, and thank you for the very promise that it never returns void. And God, thank you for building us and growing us tonight and today. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Bless, I pray, keep us safe as we travel home. Bring us back in the next appointed time, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.